The following is meant for entertainment and educational purposes. It is not meant to establish a doctor-patient relationship. Please consult your mental health provider for your mental health needs. Hello, welcome to Shea Arik, where we talk about psychiatry and religion with a focus on how to apply it to your life. And I am Dr. Eric, and I'm a psychiatrist who happens to be religious, and we're continuing with the William James series on the varieties of religious experience. And today's lecture, we're going to be starting on William James talking about the value of saintliness. So last time, we talked about saintliness and the different fruits. And this time we'll be talking about, you know, why do we care about them? Why are they valuable? And it's going to be an interesting discussion. And I believe it's going to be about seven parts. All right, so let's, let's get to it. So the first step that William James makes is this idea that if we had fixed definitions for people and dogmas about God, then we really wouldn't have to worry about anything. A religious pursuit would be easy. Just do the thing, do the rule call it a day, we're done, right? We just memorize facts about religion and we would simply do that. But we might do that if uh, to keep things simple and convenient. However, uh, the truth is much more complex than that. Uh, people aren't as rational and reasonable as we would like to believe. They're actually more like animals, very irrational, very unreasonable. And as a result, we can only really take things uh, as they are with our experience. Uh, it's very difficult for an individual to separate a supernatural experience from a natural experience. What does that mean? Well, what I mean is that it's very difficult if you had an experience, a very supernatural experience, it's hard for you to say that, oh, that doesn't exist based only on the sensation of experiencing it. So if you actually experience uh, uh, God talking to you as an audible voice, I've heard people you know, um, testify to that, you can't really distinguish that, that from having a friend talk to you with an audible voice. Your brain uh, does those things. So as a result, you we need to go into this, uh, as James says, without any a priori theological system, right? And that we just, you know, from the collection of our judgments uh, and value of these experiences that we have, we then decide on the whole, the whether a religious belief uh, is approved by um, by a fruit, by a benefit, or whether or not it's condemned, whether or not it's a bad thing. And that's the first step he makes. So this is actually a fairly challenging, a uh, very controversial concept if you think about it. A lot of times religious organizations start with the dogma, and then they talk about the experience. Whereas William James seems to suggest, no, we need to talk about the experiences first. And then from those experiences, we sift out the fruits, the value, the, and this is you know, the judgments you make, the spiritual judgments of the value of those experiences. And then you understand what the rules of the dogma should be about, and it really should center on those experiences. So the next question William James answers is, you know, how do we value these fruits? Uh, what are these fruits, right? And the thing is that, do we value these fruits based on a world where God exists or God doesn't exist? So for example, um, it, it would seem illogical to judge uh, the value of an action without first determining whether God exists. If God exists, then an action might be considered good, and then if God doesn't exist, the action could be considered bad. So for example, um, animal sacrifice. Uh, if you were sacrificing an animal for God, well, if God exists and he wanted animal sacrifices, then that would be considered good. But if God doesn't exist, then uh, uh, I guess... Uh, <laughs> I guess it was a, a useless sort of thing that you did. So yeah, very difficult to judge the value of an action, the benefit of an action, without first determining whether or not God exists. However, um, what should we do about this? Well, this brings in the theologians, the people who do talk about God and the rules and the dogma and things like that, and that we have different theologies, different beliefs about God, different beliefs about the characteristics of God. And we need to, I guess, either pick one or choose one, but then how do we choose one? Because they all have their own prejudices and all their differences. And, you know, it, 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 what should we what should we pick and, and how do we then choose? Because if one God likes oranges for sacrifice and another God likes apples for sacrifice, well, then we've got a little bit of a problem because we're not exactly sure which one uh, the God uh, is looking for. So James solves this issue by pointing out that these prejudices, these biases, these differences, um, they themselves are the fruits 
of uh, empirical evolution. What does he mean by that? What he means is that what we understand God to be today has come from many changes over time related to religion. And that we found that human sacrifices didn't really create great societies. We found that uh, other theologies, other concepts, other dogmas that we've developed over time uh, is better for society, better to produce a wonderful life. And that they are, of course, rooted in the experiences, the extreme experiences of the saints, of the people who really, truly devoted their life to God. And that we draw from their experiences to develop the dogmas, develop the ideas and theologies. And that over time, we found that certain ones work really, really well, which is why they last for thousands of years. And so therefore, in understanding God, we find that um, they always have this psychological component to it, where, you know, a, a, a God found in a, a cult is good for the members, let's say, of the cult, right? And when the cult can't use that God anymore, they just, okay, you just cut it out, whatever, right? And the fruits of a religious belief, right, they become worthless when they're discredited. So he gives the examples of the Greek gods, right? The, the Greek gods, uh, they said if you uh, promise something to Aphrodite, you would get things. If you did something else, you did other things. Uh, and they, it just didn't work, right? So that's the framework in which William James wants to bring us to answer this question. What is the value of being a saint, of being someone who devotes everything to God? And he says that we have these dynamics. The first dynamic being that it's much more complex than just a series of rules, but that the rules themselves is generated from the experiences. And over time, it seems like certain ones really, really work very well. It gets more complicated than this. So that's why this is just part one. Uh, but I'll talk to you next time about part uh, two and everything. Let me know your comments below and I'll talk to you next time. Bye. Hey, sign up for my weekly newsletter. I send out emails every week on psychiatry and religion. I realize that email is a great way to go deep into these topics. So if you want more content, check out shayareekpurel.com and subscribe over there. Thanks.